Welcome everybody to the uh, Master Naturalist presentation of Drones and Conservation. My name is Shane Holmes. I live in Long Lake, New York, which is the central part of the Adirondack Park. It's kind of the heart of the park. And I am uh, Information Technology Manager at the Adirondack Experience Museum in Blue Mountain Lake. I've been there about a decade. I'm also uh, part-time a licensed outdoor guide. I uh, guide for the museum's membership department and I also guide for a nonprofit organization that uh, services uh, veterans who suffer from trauma, war particularly wartime trauma. Um, I'm new to the Master Naturalist. This was my first year. I completed the initial training this summer. But I'm also a drone operator. I've been uh, flying drones for about a decade. My first drone was a DJI Phantom 1 back in 2013. But I'm also licensed through the Federal Aviation Administration to fly a drone commercially. So I hold a Part 107 remote pilot certificate. Certificate, sorry. And um, all my drones are FAA registered. Um, and I mostly fly uh, my drones commercially for photography. And um, this picture here is actually of Elk Lake Lodge, which is center bottom um, in Elk Lake with the uh, High Peaks Wilderness as the backdrop. It's about 12,000 acre piece of estate there. And they use this image on their website and some promotional material in the past. Uh, I thought I had, oh, there it goes. Here's a little video of some fall color that was taken this past season here on the East Inlet mountain range outside of Long Lake. Um, just a little example of some of the video that I do. So what we're gonna cover today is uh, the following topics. Uh, what is a drone? It's entomology, some modern context on the term and how the term has expanded over the years. We'll also look at um, some different types of systems, uh, some structural types, some control types, and some hybrid systems of drones. And then we'll look at some modifications and adaptations um, in the following areas of technology, operations, and software. And then we'll get right into drones and conservation, how it all began, how they're currently being used, some advantages and disadvantages of using drones in conservation. And then we'll take a, a look at some case studies and some research using drones. And then finally, uh, we'll look at what the future of drones holds for conservation. And then if we have any time at the end, hopefully we'll have a little Q&A session. So what is a drone? The uh, term drone has ties both to biology and technology. In its biological origin, a drone is a male honeybee. And uh, honey, male honeybees have a single primary function and that is to mate with a virgin queen. And they produce a buzzing sound to attract queen bees for mating. And that buzzing sound can increase in its intensity in order to deter potential threats. And a honeybee, uh, Drone is, uh, its purpose is a one-time mating and it dies after its mating. The terms in this technological origin um, started in the 20th century, uh, especially around the World War II period um, where the military used the term drone for its early radio controlled aircraft. Um, and those made a loud buzzing noise similar to that monotonous hum of the honeybee. And just like the honeybee, its single primary function was uh, as a target aircraft used for practice. And it was expendable. It was a one and done deal. Sometimes it was kind of shot from a launcher and other times it was launched from the ground. Um, but it was just used once. In its modern context, the term drone has expanded beyond uh, military target aircraft and it's now broadly referred to as uh, unmanned aerial vehicle or a UAV. 
and um, through the rise of consumer drones now and the sound of those drones, it's associated now between um, the, the, the buzzing sound of the honeybee. I'm having a hard time with this window. Hold on a second, it's blocking everything. I had to get rid of it. <laughs> okay, the, uh, the term drone, sorry. Oops. The term drone has expanded over time and through public perception and some media influence, it's now evolved to encompass a broader range of unmanned vehicles. Um, in this case, if you see in these pictures here, we have some remotely operated vehicles or ROVs. They use underwater and some um, top water type drones, boats and some various robots that are also termed as drones. But in this discussion tonight, we're just gonna refer to the drone as the unmanned aerial vehicle that we'll be discussing. Some of the drone symptom of, uh, systems that you'll find, uh, particularly there are two structural types, the fixed wing drone and the rotary wing drone. In a fixed wing drone, um, they're similar to a, your traditional airplane that you know. They have a rigid uh, wing structure that provides lift as they move forward. And they can cover a long distance and carry really heavy payloads. And they're typically known for longer flight times. But their disadvantages are is they require a runway or launcher for takeoff. They also require a significant area for takeoff and landing. And um, they can't really be used in confined spaces. Um, they're less maneuverable than a rotary wing drone and they can't hover in space like a rotary wing drone. Now the rotary wing drones have one or more rotors and they uh, can take off vertically and land vertically. Um, they're highly maneuverable and capable of hovering in place and they operate in confined spaces. Um, and they don't require a runway, but they're less aerodynamic and their flight times are shorter. Um, we'll talk about those reasons why, um, and their endurance is limited as well. This is about the, the typical type of drone that you see uh, being used recreationally today is the um, rotary wing drone. Drones can also be controlled in two types of ways, manually and autonomously. In a manual controlled drone, um, there's no human pilot on board. Um, someone is remotely controlling it from a distance and they're controlled using a remote controller or a mobile phone and tablet or even a first person view goggle set. Um, and the person controlling it or the remote controller is communicating with that drone either through a tethered line, which is communicating via electrical signals or a non-tethered line, which is communicating with radio signals. In an autonomous drone, you'll find no human pilot on board as well, but also no human controlling it. And um, they can carry out tasks on their own. They can be pre-programmed and predefined with a set of tasks. They're very highly efficient, very productive. They're highly precise and accurate and very scalable. Unfortunately, they come with a higher initial cost and they're very complex and require much more maintenance, which is time consuming and costly. Drone systems also come in hybrid form. You can have a single agent hybrid, a multi-agent hybrid, and a bio-inspired drones that mimic um, organisms, organisms in the environment. In a single agent hybrid, um, these systems convert to or simultaneously function as a drone and vice versa. And they can expand the capabilities from a single vehicle to um, a multi-functioning vehicle. And in this case, from um, the pictures on the bottom, you can see we have a rolling and flying drone. 
a um, swimming and flying drone, and then a drone that transforms into uh, one or more different types of systems. Um, you can also have a multi-agent hybrid um, where you couple two or more systems to complete a mission as a team. Um, and in the pictures below, you'll see I have uh, from the Mars mission, the Mars Perseverance rover um, and the Ingenuity helicopter that are coupled together but can separate um, when trying to complete a mission. So instead of creating one system, you can accomplish every task in the mission as an individual. Um, and there are multiple systems designed to accomplish that mission that is part of a bigger objective. And then you can have, as I talked about earlier, bio-inspired um, drones that mimic organisms in the environment, and they're borrowing the locomotive mechanism from the natural world to achieve uh, efficient navigation techniques that are similar to real living organisms. On the left, you can see we have a drone here that's mimicking a raptor of some sort or a hawk. And then we have um, one that's mimicking a um, small bird. In this case, it looks like a hummingbird. And then one that's mimicking a bat. And although this is an, an aerial drone on the far right, um, it kind of flies through the water. It's mimicking a stingray. You can also have um, flapping type drones that mimic um, birds in real life, um, drones that perch. And as I mentioned with the hummingbird style, these nano drones that can be used to get into really con tight confined spaces in a fast way. I have a little video here to play. I can move this window out of my way. Okay. This is of a um, transforming drone. So drones can also be modified and adapted in many ways, in particular in these types of areas of technology, its operations, and software, um, both onboard software and software that's um, on the remote control side of things. If we look at the technological way that they're modified and adapted, um, you can see that they are modified and adapted with enhanced cameras, sensors and telemetry, GPS and uh, mapping functionality, hardware, geophysical instruments, communication devices, and payload delivery systems. If you look at enhanced cameras, um, they are using things like high resolution cameras for capturing images in a much higher level of detail. Um, thermal cameras um, to detect heat and create images based on temperature differences, multispectral cameras um, to capture images across uh, different wavelengths of light. Um, these are wavelengths that are um, beyond what the visible spectrum is. And uh, three band RGB, which is capturing images, um, different bands of light on the spectrum of just red, green, and blue. And also cameras that can do night vision. Um, if you look at sensors and telemetry, you're finding uh, things like environmental sensors on drones that are measuring, you know, the barometer, and weather, and air quality, temperature, and also radio and uh, acoustic telemetry um, receivers that are used for tracking and monitoring wildlife, and uh, radio frequency ID readers for also tracking and monitoring wildlife. And you'll also find um, GPS and geospatial mapping hardware, um, 
The one really good example is LIDAR, which is a light detection and ranging camera that's used for mapping terrain and vegetation. And what it does is it sends a, a laser light out um, ahead of itself, which bounces off objects and reports back the timing. And with that timing, they can build a 3D model of the area. We'll also find geophysical instruments on drones, um, things like magnetometers, that measure the strength and direction of magnetic fields and gravometers that measure variations in the Earth's gravity field. And um, some other technology you'll find on drones is communications equipment. Um, you will can find drones are using cellular technology, and satellite technology and Wi-Fi technology, um, including mesh networking to not only communicate with the drone itself, but to report back data in real time. Another technology you'll find is a payload delivery system, um, which can be used for things like seed dispersal, um, collecting samples, um, applying herbicides, and fire retardants. On the operational side of things, um, You'll find things like uh, silent and stealth mode in the drones, um, allowing them to move fast and fly at high altitudes or even low altitudes for that matter. Um, and they come equipped with things like obstacle avoidance um, to keep away from trees and man-made objects, and things. And um, they also come with active tracking, which allows a drone to, to follow something that's moving um, the drone operator can set a drone on a particular um, animal and make it follow it. Um, and they can also set automated flight paths using way marking and GPS. On the software side, um, we talked talk about a couple of these things already. And the reason by that is um, things like active tracking and pre-programmed routes can be found on the actual hardware, the drone itself and its firmware, but also in software loaded on the uh, controller side of things. Um, you can also have software for things like swarm intelligence, where you can have multiple drones um, completing a mission together and real-time data streaming. So you're communicating back with uh, data in real time and maybe doing some of the real-time analysis right away on it. So now that we talked about um, drone technology and um, everything that you find on drones, we can begin to, begin to talk about drones and how they're used in conservation itself. We talked about a little bit about um, its original origins in the military back in the 20th century. But um, in the late 20th century, there were some technological advances in the military. and um, it eventually led up to um, commercial and civilian introduction of drones in the 21st century. And then in around 2010, we had widespread civilian use. Um, companies such as DGI and others started widely producing drones. Um, and then around the mid 2010s, um, you started finding drones being used in conservation efforts. Around 2017, in New York State, the DEC um, purchased and deployed a fleet of 22 drones. Um, primarily, their mission was to enhance search and rescue missions and do forest fire suppression and forest health evaluations, some wildlife management and surveys, and invasive species detection and management. But over time, um, they started using drones for uh, multitude of things like anti-poaching poaching and surveillance, habitat mapping, seed and spore dispersal, um, some nighttime monitoring, biodiversity assessments, climate change studies, and pollution monitoring. Drones used in conservation have a number of advantages, um, time efficiency, cost efficiency, safety, 
flexibility, and speed. We're going to take a look at um, each of these individually. The advantage of um, time efficiency is rapid deployment of a drone um, in real-time data collection and automated operations. These all provide um, time efficiency. Another advantage is cost efficiency. Um, the, advantage, the drone has advantage of reducing manpower costs, uh, reducing equipment costs, um, and reducing maintenance costs that you would find in uh, manual ways of doing it. Another advantage of drones is safety. Um, you can reduce human exposure with drones. If you take a look at these two photos here, there's um, a drone flying into a cave in one instance and a drone flying around some volcanic activity in another instance. Drones can also be um, flown at night um, and they can be used to minimize environmental risks, um, you know, particularly around hot and cold environments. And they can be used um, in immediate response situations to stay safe. Another advantage of drones is flexibility. Um, they're very highly adaptable, as we talked about earlier with the modifications and adaptations. Um, which allow them to be adaptable to different trains and conditions. Um, they're flexible in their scalability. As we talked about, you know, you can integrate all kinds of technologies as well. Another advantage is speed. Um, the speed allows drones to get an immediate visual assessment, particularly in things like um, disaster areas. Um, you can also uh, provide really fast data transmission if you want to do real-time analysis and um, it allows you to do automated flight paths um, in a much more speedier way. So drones also come with some disadvantages as well. Um, weather dependency is one. Um, they're also restricted uh, through regulations, and there's some technical challenges with drones. We can take a look at each of those. Uh, if we look at weather dependency, drones are limited by uh, flight operations. Um, they can get reduced visibility by weather. Uh, their signal strength can be reduced, and they could have sensor interference. And of course, you could have safety concerns with weather as well, and weather can cause operational delays in your mission. You look at the regulatory restrictions, um, drones can be limited by their airspace access. Um, anywhere there's an airport, um, there could be um, a restriction up to upwards of 10 miles away, depending on the size of the airport. And there are height restrictions as well, based on um, airport locality. Um, regulations also limit certain things you can do without a license or specific training when flying drones. And there are some privacy concerns as well. Um, nobody wants a drone peeking in on them, uh, no individuals anyways. And there are also some customs, um, you know, that would probably not appreciate drones flying over like maybe some Native American communities. Um, and then wildlife disturbance. Um, there are some regulations regarding drones and disturbance of wildlife. I know here in the Adirondack Park, drones are not allowed in the wilderness areas, particularly for that reason. Um, some of the disadvantages on the technical side of things, uh, drones require um, mostly batteries, um, and uh, batteries have a, a limited time that they can be used, and it limits the functionality of the drone. Um, and you could have equipment malfunctions. Um, the drones are, could relied on 
GPS for um, their mission and uh, so data storage and transmission of data can be a particular issue. Uh, drones can only hold so much data and transmit so much data. Um, they're also limited by their payload capacity, um, particularly some of the smaller drones. And you can have communication or connectivity issues in drones um, based on you know, locality and weather. Um, drones can have environmental sens sensitivities, particularly to heat and cold, um, also to wind strength. Um, and then of course, uh, as we mentioned earlier, um, obstacle avoidance can become an issue if there's too many um, natural and man-made objects around uh, where you're flying. Okay, um, we're gonna take a look at some case studies where drones have been used in conservation. Um, and these can cover um, areas such as wildlife monitoring, anti-poaching and surveillance, habitat mapping, forest fire detection, seed and spore dispersal, nighttime monitoring, biodiversity assessment, climate change and pollution control, and rapid disaster assessment. Um, a couple of these case studies cover a few of these. One particular uh, case study you can look at is one that related to climate change. And in this particular case, it's tracking methane leaks from abandoned oil and gas wells. And the story on this particular case is that methane, which is a potent greenhouse gas, um, has a warming potential, which is greater than CO2 over a hundred year period. And um, methane is a big contributor to global warming. New York State is very active in trying to reduce this methane emission. And the New York State DEC has collaborated with Binghamton University in Cattaraugus County in order to try and locate and cap um, some abandoned gas and oil wells. Um, some well drilling had occurred before the states uh, started some regulations today. Um, and it's been estimated that tens of thousands of wells exist in New York and their locations and conditions um, are needed to be confirmed due to their um, age and lack of information and difficult to find and sometimes difficult to get to, um, they want to try and locate um, these wells. Um, these orphan wells can be buried and hidden in thick vegetation and they lack identifying features. Um, so it hasn't been easy for um, inspectors to get out and spot these wells using traditional methods like um, old maps and manual field inspections. So a solution that came up with was uh, the DEC had collaborated with the university uh, to modify some drones to conduct some aer aerial uh, magnetic surveys. And they adopted um, drones with magnetometers and some mapping software solutions, um, allowing them a rapid and safe survey of these large areas um, in these difficult to access terrain. Um, the mag magnetometers were able to detect variations in the Earth's magnetic field, which could indicate a presence of a possible well. And using GPS or GIS mapping solution, they were able to map these locations of these wells or potential wells. This map shows um, all the potential wells that they mapped out um, in New York State. Um, and the color codes just signify um, the number of wells, the yellow indicating zero to 10 wells and the dark red 2,000 to 10,000 wells. They are successful in using drones um, in doing a uh, magnetic survey of the legacy oil and gas wells. They were able to, able to detect anomalies in the wells and the metal casings in particular, pinpointing their locations. And uh, the surveys were very efficient and uh, 
And in this, in one of the practical applications uh, where 11 wells were previously mapped on manually foot surveys, the drones proved highly effective. And over just a three hour period, they were able to locate 72 wells and then demonstrating an efficiency and accuracy of this approach. And this resulted later on in the plugging of 340 orphaned wells, orphaned oil and gas wells. In another case study, uh, particularly in the field of wild wildlife monitoring, drones were used to track endangered American eels. And um, this story goes as follows. In the, the uh, organization called the River Institute um, up in Cornwall, Ontario, which is across from um, the Aquasasini um, Reservation near Messina, New York. Um, they were originally tracking critically endangered American eels on the St. Lawrence River. Um, they wanted to understand their habitat associations, their seasonal movements and potential overwintering, loca overwintering locations. So um, they manually fitted eels with conventional radio trackers, telemetry, and released them back into the river. Um, and then tracked them conventionally using a boat up and down the river, crisscrossing the river, trying to pick up their signals. This um, was found to be slow and cumbersome. Um, and the boat launch areas were a great distance away most of the time from the presumed locations of these eels. And um, at one particular point, they tried running a plane to fly the length of the river with a radio receiver in order to speed um, this up, but they found it very expensive um, and they were looking for an alternative way. And that alternative solution ended up being um, drones. Um, the team had placed telemetry receiver on a drone and flew up and down the river with the drone. Um, this allowed them to launch the drone from essentially anywhere on the river. And this become um, much more cost and time efficient and more effective in their survey. They were able to cover a large uh, river area in a much less time, uh, allowing them to monitor their eels, and understand their travel patterns and habitat use in real time. It also provided an increased precision and in coverage, um, real-time data analysis, reduced environmental impact, it enhanced uh, their safety um, in comparison to their manual way. Um, it provided better access to remote areas and it allowed for a much longer term of monitoring. And in the end, it, provided additional innovative research opportunities. Um, in another case study, drones were used in ecosystem mapping. Um, and in this particular case, it was Phragmites survey in St. Lawrence County, New York. Um, Phragmites comes in two species. You have the um, Australis Americanus, which is the Northeast native in the Australis australis, which is an invasive species. But both of these species are uh, a nuisance. And um, they're, they're a grass, they're a very tall grass on steroids. They grow to 10 to 15 feet tall, large stands, um, uniform stands. They grow really dense um, and they grow in wetlands. And this can quickly take over a wetland area pushing out native species and forming a monoculture. The DEC re recently acquired, acquired over 200 acres near a wildlife management area called Wilson Area in St. Lawrence County. And it consisted of um, beaver swamps, thick brush and cattails. And this made travel on foot and to any of its habitats for assessments very challenging. And the DEC was interested in looking for um, Phragmites infestations in this wild, uh, wetlands area. So um, because they couldn't do it manually by feet, um, they, their solution was to use a drone and some aerial mapping solutions. And in particularly on this drone, they used uh, an enhanced camera um, that was a three band RGB sensor. Um, and it was able to detect color and textural differences and 
do pattern recognition and seasonal variations. And this was because um, of this thick, dense vege vegetation that was all uniform and um, it could be picked out. This camera could pick it out very easily. And in the end, uh, they could take these proposed sites and compare them by ground. Um, the UAVs were successful in identifying these um, large targeted stands and for controlling, uh, uh, doing a control um, infestation and loss of habitat. Uh, cameras and RGB sensors were allowed for more efficient and accurate measurements of the location, size, and extent of the stands. And this was um, done by um, having successive returns with the drones um, for visual inspections with the cameras. In other um, recent case studies, um, DEC has used drones for a bat cave survey um, in Mineville, New York. They had suspected that um, in Mineville, there was um, caves that were home to several large underground um, bat hibernation sites. Um, they were able, they failed to locate these um, on manual ground-based searches. So they used drones to detect um, these underground bat hibernation sites with thermal sensors. The drone was flown over the area of interest in a grid pattern and the hibernation sites admitted either warm air, um, which was the outside temperature was lower than the internal temperature, um, and, or it was, able, it was emitting cooler air than the outside temperature, and the drone and its sensors were able to pick up the differentiation. Um, in another case study, um, drones were used um, to, to survey southern pine beetles in the Suffolk County, Long Island area. Oops. Um, the South Southern Pine Beetle um, was an invasive forest pest which damaged thousands of acres of pine trees on Long Island. And to um, improve management efficiency, the DEC used, utilized drones um, in their natural color sensors to map tree damage from the air using automated search pattern software. And uh, they were able to locate hard to reach previously known um, SPB damaged pine trees in just a few hours rather than a few days, improving um, the survey and allowing more effective management. And another uh, couple case studies here, they used drones for a coastal erosion survey um, on Lake Ontario and um, an oil spill response. Um, in Staten Island, New York City. I'm gonna go ahead and move forward because I think I'm running out of time. And if you're interested in reviewing those, you can review them later. And we're gonna move on to ethical concerns um, with using drones. And these can be things like wildlife disturbance, which I um, briefly talked about earlier. Um, another ethical concern is leaving an ecological footprint. And um, as we talked about earlier, privacy invasion, including uh, cultural sensitivities and consent and inclusivity. When we're referring to wildlife disturbance, we're talking particularly about drones flying at certain altitudes, particularly low altitudes, that's disrupting wildlife and causing noise that's stressing out wildlife. Um, for example, nesting birds that might be disturbed um, and in banning their eggs or their chicks. And when we're referring to the ethical concern uh, related to ecological footprint, we're referring to the actual hardware, the electronics, uh, the batteries, um, and things like that that might have an environmental impact after they're disposed of. Um, and that becomes an ethical dilemma considering the balance between the ecological footprint and the uh, conservation benefits. Um, we talked about privacy invasion, um, cultural sensitivities and consent and inclusivity. Um, you don't wanna be flying drones without permission over um, particular groups of people or um, settlements or people in general without their permission. Um, 
So even if the pri primary intent is conservation, drones equipped with cameras can inadvertently capture images or videos of local communities, indigenous populations, or private properties, and this can lead to unintentional privacy breaches. And some areas may hold significant cultural, spiritual, or ancestral, ancestral value to indigenous or local communities. So flying drones in these regions without proper consultation or consent can per be perceived as a violation of their rights and traditions. And not involving local communities in the decision-making process about where drones can be, can lead to feelings of exclusion and potential conflicts. Okay, so the future of drones and conservation. What might we see um, how drones are being used in conservation in the future? Uh, we talked a little bit about swarm technology. Um, this is where you use multiple drones to complete a mission. Um, in this particular um, technology um, is used a lot in things like uh, seed dispersal and reforestation. Um, you could get it done in a rather quick time. Um, another thing in future of drones is um, extended flight times um, through enhanced battery technology. So batteries that will allow it to stay in the air longer. And they're looking at things like solar technology, uh, particularly in the, the fixed wing drones, uh, where you can place the uh, uh, solar cells out on the wingspans. And as you know, uh, artificial intelligence is uh, the new big thing nowadays. And they're looking at how uh, AI might enhance uh, drone technology and conservation in the future and we could have things like smart drones. Not that they're not smart already, but smarter drones. Uh, this is a list of the um, case study publications that I used for the three big case studies that I showed. And this is some additional resources, particularly some books and um, some website downloads if you wanna learn more about drones and conservation. And that concludes my uh, presentation on drones and conservation. And I will now open this up to uh, question and answers. Great, thank you. That was a lot of good information. And there are a lot of good questions <laughs> popping up. Um, I think the first one was Adrian asking a question that I also had, which is what is mesh networking? So yeah, mesh networking involves Wi-Fi um, technology um, and most people are now using it in their homes and that allows you to mesh um, your Wi-Fi um, transmitters and receivers close to one another to extend the communication capabilities over a greater distance. Did I say that um, understandably? <laughs> I think so. Can you give an so, example of how? It would so, be if you're using swarm technology, which is multiple drones, and they each stay behind one another at a um, at a certain distance, you can then communicate from one drone to to the other to make it back to the controller. Okay. All right. Uh, let's see. Marianne asks, "Do you have a uh, do you have to file a flight plan when operating a drone? If so, with whom and how far in advance of your flight?" Yeah, this falls under the regulatory restrictions, and that's all going to depend on the mission that you're doing and its um, locale. You know how close you are to um, airports. So you can get permission to fly near near airports, but it's on. Um, a need to need basis and they'll need to know exactly what you're doing and whether or not you can uh, get a waiver against the regulatory restrictions in that area. But it can be done. Okay. Um, Rick asks, uh, can you give an example as to how the DEC would use a drone for time efficiency, the need to launch one immediately, et cetera? Well, I I covered that in a number of ways. One, one of the particular ways was um, in that American Eel survey. 
um, they were launching down the river manually, the traditional way, launching their boats down the river long ways away from where they actually believed that the American eels were at that particular time. And they were losing a lot of time doing that. And the drones allowed them to get to a particular um, area on the side of the river and launch from that area and go directly immediately to where the eels were that they thought they would be at. Okay. Um, let's see. Adrian asks, are there incidences of bird strikes? Can drones be used to collect soil samples, vegetation samples, etc.? So that, that's multiple questions, right? Two bird questions, strikes. yes. First, yeah. so are there incidences of bird strikes? The first question is, are there any instances of bird strikes? Yes, there, there are instances of raptors attacking drones, um, particularly when drones get close to their nests. Yes, and what was the second question? Um, can drones be used to collect soil samples, vegetation samples, that kind of thing? Yeah, drones are being used to collect samples of all different sorts, um, and that's in those uh, payload systems that they have. Um, they have um, drones that can fly low altitudes and do scraping. Yeah, mm -hmm. and they even have drones that are taking water samples as well. Mm -hmm. I can imagine it would be really useful um, in the tropics when you have a high dense canopy and you want to take some leaf samples that could be. Yeah, yeah. This drone technology is um, evolving so fast and coming up with so many new ways. All right. Uh, Rose asks, is the project using drones to find methane leaking wells still happening? I am not sure if it is still happening. Um, based on the number of wells on that map, I would assume that it is. Okay. And then the same question about the Bat Cave um, project. Is that still in pro progress? That is that is still happening. As you know, bat conservation is a big thing in New York State, particularly with white nose syndrome. Mm -hmm. Nice. Um, do you need additional certification in addition to your drone license to work on these projects? This from Stacy. So I don't believe there's a license is required at all for um, research and because it's not commercial. Um, licensing is only required for commercial, commercial enterprises. Um, however, there are restrictions. So you'll want to uh, consort with particularly the DEC or any of the community um, restrictions. Um, to make sure that you're obeying all laws and you know you're not affecting any thing that you're unaware of. Okay, uh, Lori asks: Is in the Long Lake area? How restrictive is the regulation about not flying in the wilderness area? That's a great question, because as you know, there's not particularly an airport in Long Lake, but there is seaplane service in Long Lake. But there is no restrictions on seaplane. Um, areas, um, but they recommend that you talk with the seaplane companies to let them know that you're a local drone operator and that you can work out times where you fly your drone where you're not affecting the seaplane and the seaplane is not affecting you. Okay. Uh, Trips asks, how do you find a drone operator to survey a property? Oh. I don't know. I don't know if there's a, a registration for such a thing. <laughs> Word of mouth, I guess. Okay. I advertised. Okay. Let's see, there aren't any others in the box, so I have one. Um, you mentioned RFIDs being used. How far away from the animal does a drone, or how close does a drone need to be to pick up the RFID? I didn't come across any particular RFID um, case study, but based on RFIDs that I know that we use at the museum for traffic through the museum, you gotta be pretty close. That's what I was thinking, how, yeah. how much, and then how likely would you be if you were using that to, um, to disturb the animals too, because you'd have to get pretty close. But I, I did read a couple of books and a number of articles that briefly mentioned that they are used in conservation efforts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I just didn't find a particular study. Yes. 
And then uh, I had one last question, which is, um, what do you anticipate smart drones being used for most in the future? I don't know. Or what I would mean, be the most? Artificial intelligence is so new. I mean, does anybody know how <laughs> they're going to be used? <laughs> And I did not come across, a, and I did look for a case study, a recent case study where artificial intelligence might be used. I mean, really, drones are kind of, in a sense, artificial intelligence and, you know, um, particularly newer drones today and um, the software that's used on them um, uses artificial intelligence. But what I mean is the artificial intelligence that's going to evolve that we don't know about yet today, you know, in the people that are um enhancing you know, or advancing artificial intelligence don't even know what its capabilities are so i i, I just believe that artificial intelligence is going to play a major role in the future though okay um judy asks have you personally been involved with any of the dec studies i have not i would love to all right i have only flown drones commercially i've done real estate flights, I've done um, inspection surveys of poles and roofs, and um, but mostly just um, photography and videography. All right, well, thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. I think we all learned a lot and I'm, I'm excited to kind of dive into some of those topics you brought up a little bit deeper. So um, thank thanks you very much and um, Thanks to everybody who participated tonight. We'll be back um, December 8th, I think, is the second Monday. Is that right? Something around there. Um, of the, of uh, Not December, January, sorry. Um, and uh, happy holidays to everyone. Happy winter solstice and all the other things that will happen before we meet again.